you hear a thunderclap. There's a surge of lightning. Kaya goes sprawling across the ground. There is a moment as her smoking body slowly begins to clear as the smoke lifts up. Jerusalem, Lois, Barkley, you all turn and stare at the archpriest, who turns and looks at you all, throws the lobster staff up into the air triumphantly, and shrieks. <laughs> There's a thunderclap in the distance. You swear you see the fish body on the, on the mast twitch. This is maybe the worst combat I have ever partaken in. Whip one bashes Barkley over the back of the head with a pincer. It bites into Barkley, shakes him like a dog, and tosses him to the ground. Barkley drops. Kuato whip three turns to Lois. The pincer staff pierces into you, clamping around your body. It brings you in, chomps. You are not unconscious, Lois. Jag turns to Jerusalem and goes, I do not wish to die. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> We should leave. Jag's going to take the disengage action and dive off the boat. Kuatoa Archpriest walks over to the edge of the boat. It lifts up the lobster. It fires black flames. Jag sinks. Kaya, you start to stir awake. You hurt all over. You are tied up. You hear a sound coming towards you. It sounds like heavy footsteps, and then there's a third, like a clunk, almost like someone is walking with a cane or a staff, maybe? I do so apologize for the help. It can be a little overzealous. Warped, fish-headed figures moved through the woods dragging several sacks behind them. Their bulging yellow eyes stared through the veil of shadow and bark, picking up gnarled roots and jagged stones to delicately step past. It was oppressively dark in this jungle on the brightest of days. The trees here grew so thick and knotted it seemed as if they would choke out any sign of life that had the misfortune to find itself inside. Not that they themselves had much to fear. Divine favor followed them, and they would make it to their sovereign soon enough. Their self-styled archpriest watched his devoted flock struggle to heft the horse one over a fallen tree. <laughs> the three whips had been placed on that particular duty, and were finding it difficult to manage its weight and size. The archpriest's grip on his self-made staff reflexively tightened, as they stumbled slightly, and the large, bloody sack slid from the whip's grip and smashed into the mud. A brief moment of silence passed as they all turned their gaze to the lump of rag cloth. When it did not stir, the Kuatoa croaked celebratorily in relief. The horse one had been the most difficult of the group to deal with, and had it not been for the archpriest's dark lord, that blasphemous light would have struck them all down. They were blessed to have lost only one of the school in the fight, and for such a great bounty. The archpriest, now satisfied, turned to continue his trudge towards the hollowed ground. It was all Kuotoa's life mission to find and serve a truly supreme being. They had been gifted something far more precious and valuable than any resource, for the gods had given the Kuotoa faith and it was faith that drove them, consumed them. Millennia ago, their people had been captured and enslaved by false masters. Knowledge of what they had been has long since faded into only the darkest of stories, but it is whispered that they were tall, horrible things, with faces made of tentacles, given the power to feast upon the mind and spirit. They coveted the Kuotoa's faith, which they fed upon like gluttons. Driven to the point of death by false masters, the Kuatoa had nearly been wiped out of existence, all until the Supreme Being smote them, and they vanished forever into the darkness, freeing the Kuatoa. Ever since then, the Kuatoa searched desperately for the object of their faith and devotion. It was this quest that drove their people, and one that had driven the Archpriest to gather his own school of followers and leave their aquatic home journeying ever upwards in search of that very same supreme being. The surface world had been strange and terrifying at first, 
filled with awful, wrathful creatures made of metal and weapons. They hunted the Kuatoa, calling out in a stunted, blood-curdling tongue. At first, the archpriest wondered if they themselves were some sort of divine aspect. He shuddered now, fearing what may have happened to his school if he had been led astray by those things. He had brought his school to a large ship of some kind, and was, in a moment of confusion, going to offer his devotion to them. He had been so blinded by desperate hope and wicked falsehoods that he could not see that the metal creatures were drawing their weapons in anger. However, the hand of their god had intervened. Their supreme being had arrived, a vision of blazing glory on blessed wings. With a wave of their hand, they reduced the false gods to piles of ash and puddles of molten metal. Their splendor shone so blightly that when they turned to face the archpriest, the archpriest understood that the Supreme One had no eyes as to not blind themselves with their own awesome power. Ever since, the archpriest and its school served the Supreme One entirely, sailing the destroyed vessel that the Eyeless One had given them. The blazing god lifted the wreckage from the water and enchanted it, and its new followers marked the ship with a scapegoat, a slain Kuotoa made into a vision of their god's power. They gathered sacrifices of eyes, flesh, and knowledge for their god, and brought them deep into the jungle to their beloved idol, and in return they were rewarded handsomely. And these were sacrifices of high quality. Surely, the reward this night would be the greatest of all. Hmm. Oh, not a fan of that. I like the reference to the Mind Flayers. Yeah. Um, I think you'll find if you look deep enough into any Dungeons & Dragons lore, uh, the Mind Flayers are almost certainly the result of <laughs> anything. It's like, oh, uh, yeah, Mind Flayers well, did it. I'm about to kick some ass tonight. <laughs> oh, are you all kind of pretty beat? Uh, well, I'm going to kick some ass. Excellent. Okay. Some asses are going to get kicked. So, I'm going to rewind just a little bit in time, um, before we start the game today. Kaya. Yeah? You are having a dream. Oh. You are back at the academy that you studied at. The one that was on the border of the Orchard Wasteland and Grayscale. The one that you went to to first pursue the study of knowledge. And it is the night that the academy burned down. Hmm. You wake up in your room, you smell ash and smoke, and outside you are hearing screams. What do you do? I get up, I go outside. As you rush outside, you see one of the teachers being held by the throat several feet in the air. There is a massive figure, uh, easily 12 feet tall, maybe taller, with crimson red skin and large curling ram's horns. It is dressed in like a black doublet and like nice finery. There are several like jewels and pieces of old ancient jewelry that are hanging off of it. And in one hand, it is holding a massive scythe that has a glowing purple blade that seems like it's made out of arcane energy. It has this long curled tail that ends in a fork and it has these massive crimson red bat wings that are flapping behind it gently. As it turns to you, you see that its face is basically entirely featureless, except for a single large mouth filled with jagged teeth. Kaya, what did you do? Oh. Kaya isn't the type to run. But at this point, I don't think she had a weapon on her because she was in a school. Yeah. So she probably grabs a rock and just throws it. Kaya. As you do, the creature turns, its tail flicks the rock. Well, that's not fair. Roll an attack roll. Hmm. <laughs> that is a 12. You throw the rock, its tail lashes and smacks the rock out of the air. You hear a snapping sound, and then the creature drops the teacher, uh, whose body hits the ground with just a crumpled thud. 
The flames seem to roar and raise around you. You hear the screams of students that are all fleeing the scene, different teachers that are like desperately trying to herd the students away. You see one person runs into the library and then the library like erupts in a fireball. What is your name, child? I think right now her soldier training is kicking in and right now all she's thinking about is if I can keep its attention, the rest can get away. So she decides to humor him and says, my name is Kaya. I'm a student in training and a soldier. Uh, interesting. My name is Smakavos. And I believe I've come here for very similar reasons. You came here searching for knowledge, correct? I did. <sighs> You are not worth killing, so I do believe that I will let you in on a little secret. It steps towards you. It is a towering figure. This thing is like 15 feet tall and has horns. It kneels and it looks like it's peering down at you, but its face is just like smooth and featureless, except for like the single mouth. She's trying so hard to remain calm. Like, she tries to stand her ground and stay still. She clenches her fists, but that's just a poor excuse for keeping her hands from shaking. Knowledge is power. And I make sure that no one has power. And he reaches for you. And Kaya, as he's reaching for you, you feel the memories of your lessons being pulled away. You feel yourself forgetting things. Things that the teacher taught you, explaining to you about magical theory, explaining how the weave of magic is like a physical force that ties the pillar together, explaining that it is something that is maintained by the god, Corinda, going over different spells and things that you can't yet attempt because you don't have enough knowledge or like magical power, but explaining how one might learn to have the knowledge and like the arcane energy to attempt a cantrip, like prestidigitation and stuff like that, which is probably what you were learning. And you feel these memories being like stripped and pulled out of your head. You know so little. She... She does not like him, but she knows she can't fight him. Oh boy, I'm gonna... That would be a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, you are a horse. <laughs> hey. You might not have magic, but you're still a horse. <laughs> a giant demon, hmm. She rolled, she rolled poorly on making a bad decision. <laughs> hmm. Uh, I mean, she's gonna do it or not do it. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's gonna try. If you roll poorly, then it means you're going to do the thing that is not in your best interest. Yeah. She... <sighs> At that, she just... She grits her teeth and says, And that is why I need to learn. That is why I'm going to help people learn more. And she... She could feel all this knowledge sapping from her, and that just makes her angrier. And she just tries to smack his hand away to <laughs> stop him from stealing all that knowledge that she's trying to learn from her. You hit this, like, large red clawed hand, and you do smack it away. Oh. You feel him gently pull back his hand, and he goes, I don't burn down empty libraries. And he kind of, like, starts to get up, and his tail lashes, and his wings kind of stretch. Killing a mortal only sends their soul to their gods. It is a far greater punishment to live ignorant and unfulfilled. Learn more. Study everything you can. Acquire experience. And one day, I will return to take it from you. And his wings beat and there is a surge of flame and you are not unconscious. And then from then on, Kaya was like, challenge accepted. Yep. <laughs>
I've noticed that that's a thing that she does, where someone's like, you can't do that. She's like, maybe I can. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like she has no interest in doing mm-hmm. it until somebody says you can't. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lois. Oh, boy. Yeah? You are also having a similar dream. Mm. You are with your mother, your birth mother, and this is the last day you ever saw her. You remember being held in her arms, and she's this young human woman. She has kind of like light pink hair. She's wearing kind of dark clothes and has a cloak pulled up. And she's holding you in her arms, and she was walking through the streets when she comes across a group of minstrels who are performing in the street. And she goes to set you down so you could go look at the minstrels and the bards. As she's lowering you, Lois, I would like you to roll a perception check. That's a nat 20. A nat 20. As your mother is lowering you, you see a glint of a clasp on her jacket. And as you're lowering, you see it is a silver kind of medallion that is holding her cloak in place. On the medallion is a half-closed eye and the pupil is a coin. She sets you down, and she goes, Little Starlight, how about you go look at that band over there? Um, Mommy has one errand that she needs to do just very quickly. And because you rolled a nat 20, as you are set down, you walk into the crowd a little bit, but you turn, and as you do, you see your mother walking up to a knight. He is also a human knight. He is dressed in, like, not good armor. He isn't as young as your mother, but he still looks pretty young, but he's grown a... He's attempting to grow a beard. And he has kind of long, sandy blonde hair that he has pulled back into a ponytail. And your mother starts getting in a heated argument with him. Like, he's trying to talk to her and she is, like, hissing at him. Something that you don't hear. The only reason why you're seeing this at all is because of that nat 20. And then you turn, and you push and wiggle your way through the crowd until you reach the band of these minstrels and bards. And you watch them, and you... This is, like, the first time you've had an experience with music that truly spoke to you. There is something remarkably playful and energetic in the songs they play. Like, it makes you feel more alive and energized than you've ever felt by any music you've ever heard before. The center of this performance is this beautiful woman with long red hair in, like, this dress who is the main singer, but she's also dancing. She's doing this, like, spinning, chaotic dance. It's really hard for you to track this song because these notes aren't going in the way that you're used to. Like, this isn't Libertina music, and that's why you're so fascinated by it. And you watch this woman doing her incredible performance, and you were just enthralled by her music. And she finishes her set, and they do another set, and another, and the crowd kind of moves. Before you know it, there are different people standing next to you, and then eventually they toss some silver or copper at the woman who does this very elegant bow, and then they move on, and then before you know it, it's dark, and the band is packing up and going. And when you turn around, Your mother is gone, and the man that she was yelling at is gone. And as you're looking around for your mother, the woman that was the lead singer, she, like, walks up to you, and she kind of ruffles your hair, and she bends down, and when she does, she has these brilliant emerald eyes, like, bright emerald. And she goes, I have a feeling that you are going to be a very famous musician one day. Where are your parents? don't know. Tell you what, how about you go into that tavern over there, and you wait, and I'm sure your mother will be along to pick you up shortly. And you do, and you wait in the tavern, and your mother never shows up. You never did find your mother after that. And for a bit there, you were kind of like a homeless like street urchin for a very long time who made his money pickpocketing people until you tried to pickpocket someone 
that you really shouldn't have. And the last thing in this dream, in this memory that you remember, is the figure turning and staring at you with these bright emerald eyes. And then your dream ends. Ooh. Mm. Jerusalem. Yes. Like all the others, you are having this dream, but this is a little bit different for you because... Elf dreams are, like, generally memories of, like, past lives or, like, visions and stuff like that, them, like, sorting through their memories. So this isn't as weird or charring of an experience for you. You feel yourself sifting back quite, quite a while away to when you were very young. You're, like, at that age where you have to look up and all of the adults in your life seem like they're 10 feet tall, and it's really hard for you to imagine how you would ever get that big. And, like, just the world is not built for your size. Like, that's how small you are. And you are wandering around your family's estate late, late at night. Not that that makes any different because there's no day <laughs> where you're from. And I would like you to make an investigation check. That is uh, 18 plus 7, 25. Okay. From Jerusalem. You kind of pick your way through the estate to the area where your great-grandmother lives. As you're going, you kind of, like, peer through this room where you know that your grand, uh, your great-grandmother works. Um, and you see your great-grandmother, Eleanor. Because she is an elf, she does not look... She has this kind of, like, ageless appearance to her. But she is, like, ancient. She is, like, several centuries old at this point. Like, she's starting to look like a 50-year-old human. <laughs> Almost. Her pale blue skin is starting to show the first signs of, like, wrinkles and cracks. Her hair, which was, like, silver before, is, like, starting to become, like, a less lustrous, like, gray and white that she has pulled back into, like, this tight bun. When she is dressed in, like, this Victorian-era dress, it almost looks like. And she is rubbing her temples, and you see she has taken off her glasses and set them down on her desk next to a small wooden box that has these things written on it that you can't read. But it is, like, moving a little bit. And she is rubbing her temples, and she looks very frustrated. The box is moving? Yeah, the little box that she's placed her glasses on. It's on the edge of her desk, and it's, like, moving a little bit. You Like, if it moves a little bit more, you think it might, like, fall off the edge. Am I shorter than the desk? Yes. I would like to sneak up. <laughs> sure. Rolled stealth. Okay, I got a, a 17 on stealth. Okay. And Jerusalem isn't going to... He's not reaching up to grab it. Yeah. He's sneaking up so that if it does fall, he can catch it before it hits the ground and see if it won't make a noise. You slip unnoticed um, into your great-grandmother's study. And as you do, you... This is like your first experience with what your family does but also with a greater, higher magic. Your great-grandmother started the Estiero family as almost like a military company. Like, she was a war caster in the Great Calamity. Like, she was one of the last elves that fought on the front lines of the Divine Culling, and she made a lot of money offering, like, her arcane services that way. And so you see all these charts and letters from different groups and you see different banknotes and things compiling amounts of coin in different bank accounts all over the world on different continents even and as you're looking you turn and you see there's this page that she has pinned up on the wall from a book that it looks like the page was ripped out of the book and placed up and it is written in Hierarchane, and so you can't read it. But there is, like, this diagram of this red being with horns and a smooth, featureless face. 
and it almost looks like an anatomy drawing. You know, like there are like lines pointing out like the placement of organs and things on it. Okay. And does this box topple off the edge of the desk? If you don't mess with it, it does eventually, yes. Okay. Um, Jerusalem is there to catch it so it doesn't make a noise when it hits the ground. As it falls, you catch it. And you are holding this small wooden box with letters written on it. It feels warm in your hand. And it almost is beating like a heart. There's a soft gasp. And then immediately you are swept up into the air and you are being held by your stomach by your great-grandmother who's just holding you at arm's length. I'm still holding the box out in front of me. Little Jerusalem, what do you have there? This fell off your desk. What is it? Ah, yes. This is your great-grandmother's heirloom. Must never tell anyone that you have seen this, do you understand? This is very, very precious to me. And if you are okay, good... what is it? She kind of pauses. You see her thinking it over. She plops you down in her chair and reaches out her hand. She has these long, perfectly manicured nails that have runes inscribed on the inside of them. And so she extends her hand, and she uh, does it open palm, so you see on the inside of her long, perfectly manicured nails, there are runes. She goes, It is something I took a long time ago from someone that I was not supposed to have. Uh, um, Jerusalem puts the box in her hand. Her hands slowly curl around the box, and she places it back on the desk. She goes, I was hiding it somewhere for some time, but unfortunately, a prank has caused that area to no longer be a good hiding place, and so I am looking for a different place to put it. Do you have any ideas, Little Jerusalem? I know some places that are small. Okay, Jerusalem. Show me one of these places. And? If you are good, and you do your work, and you learn to take things like I have, maybe one day we will get you a similar box, and you will have your own little treasure that you can hide somewhere as well. And she extends her hand, and you put your little tiny blue hands in hers, and she feels very cold. And you take her to a different place in your family's estate, and you show her where to hide the box. And that is the end of your dream. Jerusalem's eyes just like, <laughs> as a child, went wide when she's like, you can have your own treasure. Oh. It's like, I want a mysterious box that no one will know about. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that is where we get uh, the scene from where we ended our last episode, that last closing um, scene where Kaya slowly stirs in this big derelict cathedral and hears a voice uh, kind of speak to her and apologize um, for the zealotry of their underlings. Um, and now we are in the modern day. Um, Lois and Jerusalem, you also find yourself stirring awake with those uh, dreams uh, in your head. Yeah, Jerusalem is not happy. Mm. Um... Oh, should we mention to everyone that we leveled up? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I decided to give everyone a point of XP. Um, I Normally, I only let them mark experience for finishing a quest. But, I mean, I figured... We almost died. That was the end of that quest. So, technically, you did finish a quest. So, I let you have that XP and let everyone level up. Um, the Braid is now level 4, and their hirelings are now level 2. I'd also like to say Riley, uh, in that leveling up, the re another reason he gave it was because he was like, y'all, I have to rearrange so many things. Yeah, you guys weren't supposed to get here for a bit, but here we are. So, I don't know if we want to say what we leveled up with. Um, if you guys would like to just pause before we jump into like more roleplay and action and stuff and just say what you did for your levels up, uh, sure, go for it. Sure. 
um, because I personally am really proud of what I chose. Um, we <laughs> Riley gives the option to take the the feet alternative instead of yeah. just having to do the. We the we allow right? feats in so. this house. That's, I'm not a that's monster. That's a D&D thing. It, it, it is a variant yeah, rule, and not everyone allows it. Yeah, it, it's hmm. a house rule kind of thing where you don't always do it. Um, but anyway. I chose the Mage Slayer feat because having been TPK'd by a mage, I felt it was very, very fitting to Jerusalem to add these, <laughs> this, this archpriest to his list of, uh, vendettas. Mm. I'm going to learn a skill to spite you in particular. <laughs> it's more of a Jerusalem will remember that. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, we have fought another mage before, the MILF, so... Yeah. He's had some experience. We had some problems. The MILF had a name. The MILF, who shall not be named because we don't, uh, talk about her. Her name was Luxabelle. You mean Luxabelle and me? The number one person <laughs> on Jerusalem's vendetta list? <laughs> I like that Jerusalem has... Jerusalem has a little book somewhere on his person, and in that little book, he has a little <laughs> list. And on number one of that list is Luxabelle Lumi, head of the Lumi clan. And on number two on the list, it's that stupid fish. <laughs> <laughs> the had the heckin' the lobster stick. Okay, I was writing down Archpriest, I'm changing it to that stupid fish. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll go, so... I just gave, um, I boosted my charisma instead of, I was at a 16 for charisma, which was a plus three. I'm at an 18, which is a plus four right now. Incredible. Kaya was also a little upset about the last fight. So I gave her pole arm master. Uh, one, because she's been, I've been focusing her on using the glaive and the halberd. Uh, over the sword that she had, which I also gave away. So I took Polar Master because of that, which gives me, uh, when I take an attack action with the Glaive, Halberd, or Quarterstaff, I can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of the weapon, which is a d4. Um, however, as a reaction, when another creature provokes an opportunity attack when they enter my reach... I can, uh, use the weapon on them. <laughs> oh, so that is a thing unique to Kaya. Um, normally opportunity attacks are only triggered when someone leaves your reach, but Kaya, because of this feat, now triggers opportunity attacks when yeah. people enter her reach. So if someone gets within 10 feet of her, she can immediately smack them. Yep. I like that you two took feet and Lois was just like, he basically in that own was just like, I just need to get more charismatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how both two of the three of us were, like, traumatized by the fight, so we took something that would help us in the future, and you're just like, I want to be prettier. <laughs> if I was hotter, this never would have happened. Well, I just kind of thought like, if I had just been a little bit hotter, I could have talked to them down. That is his mindset. Um... We are back in the present day. Um, you are all drifting uh, awake. You are in this dilapidated cathedral. Um, and we just get uh, the closing scene of the last episode where um, this old man came in and apologized for the zealotry of his minions. Uh, I would like to say, Lois, upon seeing the, um, the moth on the table, he mm -hmm. just just very much tenses, like the others can definitely yeah. feel it, and he goes, well, fuck me. Not in the good sense. And he says that <laughs> quietly, you know, that only, like, those two years. <laughs> Pardon me, I apologize for my late arrival, but I'm very busy these days, and you all have been unconscious for some time. Question. Oh. I mean, yes. Are we tied up in ropes? Um, yes, you are all bound with rope. Can I roll to escape the ropes? Um, sure. Um, cool. while you're doing that, I'm, I'm going to describe the person that is in the room. Um. 
Okay. Hey, Lois. Meanwhile, it's like, no, no, Kyle, yeah. no, you're the one that has to think things through. Don't, don't. Um, he is like this older, older human. Um, he's kind of hunched over, like with age. Um, he is dressed in like these gray robes. He has like a woolen shawl placed over his shoulders. Um, and he is, uh, walking with the aid of a cane that has a large amethyst implanted into it. Um, not unlike the amethyst that you got from the followers of Greater Divinity. Um, he has a thick white beard and shoulder length white hair. And he is looking at you guys with these, uh, like these, uh, pinkish eyes that have kind of like gone milky and faded with age. Um, and he kind of hobbles in on this, um, staff, uh, and you see he has the sign of the Obscura, the, the silver medallion with the half-closed eye with the coin, um, pupil on it, um, and he, like, <clears throat> and, uh, lowers himself into a church pew, uh, across from you all, and sits kind of heavily. Lois, I would like to say, is very quietly, like, whispering, like, quiet, quiet, don't make me be the voice of reason. It's- Am I adding a proficiency to this, or is it just a strength? No, check? just your strength. Okay, so that's a 21. Um, Kaya, you... I just want her to flex. <laughs> like, flex, and you can feel the ropes breaking. Um, you feel that, like, with that 21, you could snap through these ropes. Um... And the old man in front of you goes like, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, I have a couple of buddies around here. And why not? Well, for one, you don't know where you are. Uh, and you have, uh, what you would presume to be an enemy making direct eye contact with you. I can see, uh, your arms working there. I think we could do some better chatting. If we weren't tied up. I was about to apologize, but, um, just wanted to say that it wasn't a good idea to try and escape your captor in front of him. What's the point of all this, anyways? No, no, I, I, I again apologize for my fish friends. Um, they get a little confused sometimes. But I gotta say, guessing from your, uh, bluish complexion and those pointed ears. Uh, you're a moon elf, aren't you, boy? Obviously. What's your point? Alright. Uh, a moon elf all the way in grayscale. It's just it's such a coincidence. You wouldn't happen to be, uh, related to one moony estiero, would you? I would like to As- say life is going through literally the five stages of grief. <laughs> <laughs> literally. Which stage is he at right now? No, it's like looping back. Oh, no. <laughs> Every time somebody says something new, he's like, oh, no. <laughs> so, like, he's at acceptance, but then when that happens, he, said, he hears the SEO again. It's just right again. <laughs> Jerusalem goes, as a matter of fact, yes, and <sighs> the SEO family does not take kindly t- to grievances. Oh, no, no, I, I'm an old friend of the Estiero clan. Oh, good people, every last one of them. Press exited out. Uh, but I gotta say, uh, I, I don't appreciate your relative trying to come in and muscle in on my business. Uh, I've been working awful hard to get my guild started, uh, in Shadowhorn. And get in good with the dragon head there. And, uh, you're full-blooded, so I'm gonna guess. Cousin? Nah, you're a little too young for that. Uncle? Yeah. Your, uh, your uncle, uh, comes in here and tries to muscle in on my territory. Which, (laughs) I have to admit, isn't very neighborly. I'm gonna just, again, make a wild assumption and guess that, uh, he went calling and asked for all uh, the little kitties to come back him up because he didn't have the muscle to force uh, my kids out of town. Am I getting close? So what's your goal here? Ransom? 
Oh, <laughs> not at all. Uh, I'll let you all go in a moment. I'm going to call in my uh, personal doctor in just a little bit. He's going to see to your wounds, and then we're going to let you all go. Uh, as long as you promise to uh, butt out. Jerson kind of, like, glances over at both Kaya and, um, Lois. Well, I have no idea what's happening in regarding any of that, so unless I hear otherwise, of course. You're right, you're right. I apologize. Uh, when you get to my age, you stop wanting to wait for things. You have so little time left, you understand. Uh, I have some aquatic associates who, uh, good bunch, good bunch of kids. But, uh, you see, they have uh, mistaken me for, uh, some sort of heathen deity that they may, uh, pray to. Um, and well, uh, I'm never one to look a gift horse in the mouth. So, uh, I said, sure. So now they work for me. And they bring me what they see, uh, that they think that I might want as a sacrifice. As a I prefer to think of it as business acquisitions. You ran afoul of my little fishy friends. Uh, and they brought you all here to, uh, my little base. You've been unconscious for several days. Oh! I would like to say I really hope the other two can notice that Lois is uncharacteristically very quiet. Yeah, Jerusalem looked towards Lois to see some sort of, like, reaction to them being just let go. <laughs> Lois is just trying so hard to say nothing because that moth and just mm -mm. Mm -mm. he's like I am not fucking with this. You all can go walk free uh, right on out of this cathedral, or you can uh, follow your muscular friend there and snap your bonds and kill an old man. Wouldn't be too hard for you, but uh, I do warn you that. You have no idea where you are, and uh, this area is a little bit bigger than the one room in the one building, so I'm not quite sure how far you would get before you ran afoul of some more of my friends. Where are two other compatriots? Uh, the lizard and the, the wooden boy. They're around. The lizard had to be placed with the doctor's care specifically. Um, and the wooden boy, uh, <laughs> I gotta admit, I found just fascinating. I had to take a look at him myself. But, uh, he woke up a bit before all y'all, and, uh, he's been treated quite nicely. So is that it, then? Can I roll insight? <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can roll. <laughs> That'd be nice. You all can roll insight on this dude. Yeah, I think Jerusalem's, Jerusalem's just been, like, very intensely, like, squinting at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a 15. Oh, great. Uh, wisdom? Uh, uh yeah. Oh. Inside is wisdom. Okay. Yeah. Well, never mind then. I got a 19. <laughs> oh. Uh, that is a 17. Okay. Um,. Kaya and Lois, you cannot get a read on this guy. Um, but Jerusalem, you are a bit more used to, like, these types. Um, and so you pick up a couple of things. Um, one, this man is extremely dangerous. Uh, and for one, when he says, I'm an old family friend, that just means I know your family. We run in the same circles. This guy is probably, like, a gang leader of some kind. We we've he's basically just said that he is the leader of the rival mm -hmm. gang that we have been sent to. <laughs> yeah, he said he was the leader of an adventuring guild. You are piecing together that mm -hmm. this guy isn't a friend mm -hmm. of your family. This guy is like an ancient rival of your family in terms of criminal activity. Um, 
And you also, with an, you got a, what was your roll exactly? 19. And, okay, with a 19. Um, you pick up that, like, this guy is a really, really powerful mage of some kind. Like, you see, like, on the things that are hanging off of him and on the wizard, you see bits of, like, high arcane, that script, that, like, that really high level, like, um, math formulas that, like, really high level wizards write out. Like, this looks like the kind of stuff that your great grandmother Eleanor was writing in, in your dream just now. Okay. Um, so Jerusalem kind of, like, thinks for a moment and then speaks up. He's like, so we agree to go and you just let us free? Yeah, go on, get, uh, we'll, we'll even set it all up so you can make your way back to civilization. I don't suppose you would have any idea where you are. Uh, we'll bring you right on over to Shadowhorn and you can meet with your uncle. You just explain the situation that, uh, your uncle needs to look to open up, uh, another branch of the family chain somewhere else. And who exactly, shall I say, sent this message? Oh, I don't suspect your uncle would know who I am. Uh, you just let him know that the Obscura is already taking up root here. He knows who they are well enough. I feel like finally Lois uh, clears his throat and he goes, That I, is that... What you call the obscura? Yeah, it's um, it's a little uh business that I've put together out of odds and ends, uh, friends like. We're just a just a small adventuring guild uh, set up in a couple places. If you're a couple of plate I wouldn't call a couple of places. Ah, uh, just enough for a few chains. You know how it is. We're nothing big. So then, old friend of the family, I don't suppose you would let me know who you are. I don't have any problem letting you know who I am, as long as you don't uh, inquire. As to who's hired me or who placed us on this trail, my name is Vakonsha. I, as you can see, hail from Libertina, from way up north. Have you been? If the other two haven't, I certainly have. Oh, fantastic. Um... I gotta say, we mostly, uh, work up there and maybe go up a little bit into refuge. Uh, it's a rare opportunity that someone from Libertina gets to come down to Grayscale. And, you know, I would hate to disappoint my clients. Whew. I need to get a drink of water. I am shredding my throat with this voice. Yeah. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> this, this... Weird, like, hillbilly accent. <laughs> he's not hillbilly, he's uh, just an older gentleman. Jerusalem just kind of, uh, thinks for a while and then is like, Alright, fine. Um, I don't suppose your little adventuring guild might have some missions they need outsourced? After all, it's not like we're going to be able to finish our original mission. Ooh, you're an enterprising sort. But, uh, I gotta say, we're a bit more, uh, well-staffed than you all. And, uh, you know, we're here on the job. It wouldn't, uh, look very professional of me to start, uh, sloughing off work to strangers. You gotta understand, when you're working for these religious types, they get they get awful touchy about that sort of thing. Kaya squints. 
Mm, I bet you could. Yeah. Uh, tell me, madam, uh, you, uh, you pray to the bird, right? Osmaldus. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Ugh, the Vakomsha takes a long drag of water for some reason. Um, <laughs> this guy <laughs> pulls a glass out of his coat pocket. <laughs> this guy smokes ten packs a day. Yeah, <laughs> he he pulls out like a flask. He sips from the flask. He sits it down. <laughs> yeah, Osmaldus. That's hilarious. Is it so? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit it's um. You know, I, I I would have never been a religious sort, but I don't I don't get a lot of them personally. But uh, the bird one always seemed to make the least amount of sense. <laughs> Kai is making the math meme. <laughs> the least amount of sense, God of knowledge. What? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you uh. You pray to a hurricane that got afraid. You pray to a... You pray to something that uh, says you're not supposed to uh, mix uh, the different layers of the pillar, but, uh... Aren't them celestial folks from upstairs? Seems a little hypocritical is all. Are they? Yeah, that's the whole pillar thing. I guess. No, he's saying that the gods are like celestials from higher pillars. Yes. So they are. Uh, cele- the gods are celestial beings from the top of the pillar. Yes. And that is why Asmaldus requires us to do his work for him. Mm, sure. But, uh... You know, it, uh, you're not the worst of them. You, you got, you got those knights up in Libertina uh, running around for uh, Godric and uh, the uh, what's your face, uh, Corinda. Yeah, they, 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 <laughs> they love those two up there. But uh, nah, never made much sense to me. Uh, we're here with a. Uh, we're here with followers of something I can get a little bit more behind. I've gathered. What, is that the moth? Yeah! <laughs> so. I assume you can get behind it because it's in your favor? Mmm. Eh. I just, I kind of like what they, uh, their whole deal, right? Uh, passion, ambition. You know. You like to be worshipped. I'm not being worshipped. I'm just being paid. In sacrifices. <laughs> no. No. They're sacrificing to something else, something bigger. But I'm not supposed to talk about that. You didn't hear it from me. He presses a finger to his lips and like makes a shushing sound. And then he takes another swig from his flask that he definitely has. <laughs> point is, point is, point is, you know, I'm working for these folks. They, they don't, they don't want flies in the ointment. They don't want, the, you know, extra ingredients in the soup and all. So I'm just going to politely ask you all to leave. And if you can't do that, then uh, we'll hold you here for a bit. Well, I'd agree with leaving, but unfortunately, Jerusalem kind of like wiggles in the ropes. <laughs> yeah, well, it is what it is. You can never be too careful these days. There's all sorts of rumors about uh, ruffians and thieves on the road. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. Kaya wants to strangle this man. <laughs> so, do we have an arrangement? Yeah, sure. Great. As long as you give us back our belongings and our friends. Sure, sure. 
Tell you what, uh, he looks out the window. It's, like, getting pretty dark. Uh, he goes, It's, uh, just about dinner time, actually. So, uh, tell you what, we'll cut you free of them rope. You can come eat with us, have your fill, maybe spend the night, and in the morning you can be on your way, or, you know, maybe you decide to stick around, and we'll go from there. But uh, I would recommend you all take off in the morning. Now, why exactly would we want to stick around? Oh, all these woods get dangerous at night. I personally think that it would be a wise choice, considering the state we are in, as well as the fact that if we are in the company of the kinder folks, and they did this, I would not like to encounter those who would not treat us so kindly. Oh, who knows what's out there? So we have an agreement. I'll let you go, and when the time comes, you go your merry way, and you tell your uncle to back off. Sure. Anything for an old friend of the family. Scum, how about you get in here? Um, and a figure kind of- Scum? Yeah, he's a scum. And a figure kind of steps into the room. Um, two figures. Uh, the first is a woman in, um, like a tight, uh, leather armor, uh, get up. Um, she has, like, this green, uh, mottled skin. Um, you see her hair is, like, thick and wet and kind of gooped together in a way. Um, it almost looks like her hair is made out of mud. Um, and she has it pulled back into a ponytail. Um, and she's dressed in the suit of black leather armor that she's kind of like purposely left the clasps on the front of her chest undone. Um, and on either side of her shoulders, she has the sign of the Obscura. And following behind her is a figure in like this, um, black and green, uh, suit of, what, let me just double check the, also, like, this black and green, uh, suit, also of leather armor, and has this, um, thick, uh, cloak pulled over their head, um, and they have, like, a bit of fabric pulled over over their mouth. As they get closer, and the two figures start to get, uh, you free. I'm just gonna roll real quick. Um, Kaya, the hooded figure bends down in front of you, and you see under their hood, they're, the top of their head is dominated by one large eye. Um, just one big eye. Um, and they just kind of whisper, I'm awfully sorry for the bonds, but, uh, we had to be sure. Um, they take... Uh, a small dagger out of their pocket, which you see has the uh, symbol of Sylph, which is like this mo uh, moth butterfly, and they uh, quickly uh, cut you free, Kaya. They Wait, oh, no, no, no. Hmm? Kaya, as he's pulling out the knife, Kaya just unblinkingly, f just stone faces, no need, and flexes. <laughs> <laughs> and the ropes go flying off with that 21 from earlier. Just does not break contact. Like, oh, Okay, um, and they turn and they step over and they just start cutting Jerusalem's bonds. Um, Lois, uh, the woman with the, uh, dark green skin and the brown, like, mud hair, um, bends down in front of you and draws out two long daggers, uh, and she starts cutting you free, Lois. Yeah, I'm just gonna stay still. I'm not- honestly, Lois is very- uncomfortable at this point because it's just Jerusalem's like finally there you go see that wasn't so bad uh, my friends here scum and concona they're, they'll help you over to the cafeteria and they'll get you a bowl of stew I gotta work late tonight you understand how it is gotta keep the client happy you know something about that, huh? Okay. And he, like, heavily lifts himself out of the pew uh, and starts to hobble out of the room on his amethyst-headed uh, cane. 
can't get over the dad noises. <laughs> um, and you are all left with um this uh woman in the um the leather uh, armor and the hooded figure with the one big eye. Uh, I feel like finally with Lois doing that, he's still very tense as he goes. What does the symbol mean? Oh, you mean the this? Uh, she f- like gestures to her uh, the two pins of the scope. She's like, I'm gonna be honest. I don't really know. Um, I I guess it's branding that they worked out uh, before we joined. And Concona, the one with the big eye, just kind of whispers. <laughs> It has to do with how we set our sights on riches. Good goal. So, are you guys part of this adventuring guild or something? Um, Kunkona nods. The woman who you take to be scum um, smiles and she goes, I'm actually the leader of this branch. Um, that your he said it was your uncle, right? Your uncle's been bothering us for a little bit now. Um, but uh, yeah, I head up the obscura here in Shadowhorn, but we all answer to Vakomsha, and Vakomsha answers to the client. I see. You don't have any idea who the client is, do you? We're not really supposed to talk about it, but um, she gestures at the moth that's been sacrificed on the altar. um, And then gestures at the abbey, like the dilapidated abbey that you're in. She's like, got a hard on for this whole bug cult thing that they're going for. um, Some sort of a subsect of followers of Sylph, I guess. Mm. Why must everyone use hinted terminology? Jerusalem just kind of like turns over to her, like, do you know what kind of. Uh, I would also like to say a uh, message I can send to, um, since that's a cantrip, I can do it to both. Um, yeah. Kaya. Uh, I'm going to use that voice very uh, quietly, like, he just kind of hums ver- something very quiet, like, mm-hmm. like, acting like he's bored, but in his head, he's saying to Kaya and Jerusalem, it, it's, uh, I can't remember the stupid demon lord, god damn. Ropolo Serex. Yeah, but I imagine Lois literally says, like, I can't remember, fuck, um, the one that slept with Sylph and had mauled children. That's the guy. Like, he's, like, so panicked. He's, like, bad vibes. Bad vibes. I'm just... Yeah, well... Um, actually, Riley, so... We have learned that this is a... Thieves' Guild. Um, because... Mm, Quote-unquote. Because it was in the, um, the message. Your uncle, yeah. yeah Your uncle let you know guild. that it is a Thieves' Guild. Yeah, the conf- Posing the, the as an adventuring show. guild here, yeah. Yeah, it was like, it's an adventuring guild. Um, in that case, does Jerusalem happen to see any, like, thieves can't symbols around? Um, you can roll, um, you can roll perception. Everyone can roll perception here. I mean, um, or, okay. or like a different skill if you think it'll suit you best. Oh, not 20. Oh, I got an 18. Okay. The Lord says no jack shit. I got a ten. <laughs> well, I could roll religion, I guess. Uh, Kaya, you also have your divine sense and uh, some spells that you could cast to garner more information. Uh, yeah. Do the thing for Jerusalem, and I'm gonna look at that stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So Jerusalem's um, Jerusalem. specifically around yeah. for the the sort of symbols that thieves would use that are. Mm-hmm. Code for what kind of place they're in, what's around, what's... Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't see any thieves can't, like, hidden on the walls or the pews or anything, but the girl, 
um, Scum, she has a Thieves Can't uh, tattoo on her wrist. Yeah, what's it mean? One moment, I have to pull up her character sheet. How dare you? How dare you? I did not think I'd have to pull this up. I totally forgot about that. Um... I'm surprised you even, like, planned ahead to put a Thieves Can't tattoo on that. <laughs> well, yeah, she is She is also a rogue. Yeah. So I saw that she knew Thieves Can and wanted to put that in um, in case you used your languages, because I always want to encourage characters to use their languages. I mean, I just expect you to make half this stuff up. I'm always surprised when you said that you had something <laughs> planned beforehand. <laughs> Um, on her uh, wrist is tattooed in these can't for the family. Mm. Don't like that. Family. Does that have any significance that I know of? <laughs> um, how high did you roll on that perception? I rolled a nat 20. You got a nat 20 on that perception. Okay, with that, you would know that um, Concona has the exact same tattoo. Vakomsha does not. Interesting. Ooh. Jerusalem kind of looks between the two of them. He's like, so did you guys like join at the same time or where are you from? Uh, Scum is like, uh, we can talk about this in the cafeteria. We don't have to be in this creepy uh, abandoned cathedral. Yeah, that's fair. Oh, thank God. It's doing such bad things for my complexion. Lois, I don't, like, Lois has, is very much a, I'm very involved in my looks, but a mm -hmm. good portion of it is an act. Like, a good yeah. chunk is an act. So, uh... Jerusalem just kind of goes, yeah, as our bard, that's kind of all he's got going for him, so let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh -huh. looks and goes, oh, well, I don't see your looks getting us some coin, thank you very much. Oh, well. I don't need them to. That's what you're here for. <laughs> exactly. So don't insult the pretty face that gets you more money. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm tired. <laughs> I think Kaya has been almost completely disconnected from this conversation. And she's been checking out the church. <laughs> um... I think I'm going to try the Divine Sense. Uh, she activates that. Uh, presence of strong evil registers as noxious odors and powerful good rings like heavenly music. Uh, as an action, I can detect the location of celestials, fiends, and undead within 60 feet. Uh, I, the type that it is, but not its identity. I can also detect the presence of any place or object that has been consecrated or desecrated. Okay. Um, so, do you want to do the evil smells bad, good, uh, sounds nice, or do you want to skin that differently? <laughs> um, I think, considering how, uh, I've been kind of flavor texting her magic so far, I think she sees it as light. Like, auras. Okay. Sure. Um, so, uh, two things immediately ping to you. Um, this whole area is desecrated holy land. Um, this abbey, uh, belonged to Sylph at one point, but that is not the case any longer. Um, and, uh, the figure that just left the building, um, is fiendish. Like, is registering as a being mm. of the lowest. Um, also, below your feet, there's also a powerful fiendish, uh, force. You feel like, you see, like, coming up from the ground, something black and green, like a black and green glow. I, I guess black doesn't glow, but you, you, and for our purposes, it does. Yeah, yeah. Um, like a, yeah, yeah. The type they do where it's like, it's a glow of, like, yeah. the surrounding the black, like that purplish, creepy one. Yeah, it's, it's like when you look at a black hole, it seems to be glowing black. But that's because there's just nothing. It is the absence of light. It's a shadow, but the other direction. <laughs>
Uh, I think you two just, if you look at her, you just see her, like, grimace, and she looks very unhappy. I think we're all pretty unhappy. <laughs> like, she's been keeping her cool so far, but then just, like, as she looks up at the temple, and then her gaze goes down... Jerusalem's been holding back on his disgust, but the moment that the other people were like, let's get out of here, is like, thank goodness that even they hate this place. Kaya wants to go down there. experience listeners it's end credits time i know you love hearing this part but i like to remind you guys that you can find us on tumblr instagram and even tiktok and if you like to buy the music you can buy it all at markexperience.bandcamp.com we also have a constantly growing collection of merch at redbubble.com slash people slash mark dash experience where you can buy posters and shirts and stickers and all that if you want to support your favorite editor and musician you can head over to my coffee account at coffee.com slash Jamie Remy. That's spelled J-A-M-I-E-R-E-M-Y. Mark Experience can be located basically anywhere podcasts exist now, so you can listen wherever's easiest. See you next episode!